well, probably more accurately, last week we released JRuby 9000. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> For those people who don't know the story, um, we couldn't come up with the version numbers, so we came up with a joke, and the joke became reality. It's over 9,000 was what Vegeta said um, when he couldn't believe Goku's power level. Um, and we'll be over 9,000 in the next week or so when we put out our first point release. So the big bullet uh, um, points for 9,000 is that we're compatible with Ruby 2.2. We have a brand new runtime, which we'll be talking about. Um, in this release, we're bypassing the JVM a lot more and going down to C because the JVM is not quite giving us enough power, and through uh, a big effort, uh, um, Onigurumas transcoding support's been fully ported. So on our roadmap, we essentially have two, two uh, branches that we support today. The first is what we're talking about today, which is 9,000. Um, probably the week after we get back, we'll put out our first point release. But um, it's important to point out that JRuby 1.7 isn't going away. I think there's plenty of people that still depend on J uh, Ruby 1.9 support. So it'll be there as long as you need it. And uh, um, every four to six weeks, we should put out a point release. If we don't, um, and there's something that's fixed, um, prod us a little bit and we'll get it out. This is probably the most contentious slide in the uh, in the deck. Uh, um, so um, minor and security are, are fairly obvious, um, and I don't think anyone would disagree with those. But you'll notice that we have two numbers now after that. Uh, um, so nine really will be the major number. If, if we do something that's not going to be backwards compatible, or if Ruby puts out a release of Ruby that's not compatible, we'll have to rev that number. But um, with that said, Ruby is not changing the language semantics to such an extent that we shouldn't be able to, um, your code should still work when 2.3 comes out. So we're hoping that we can just make 9.1 um, the next release when Ruby 2.3 comes out, and we're not going to create another support branch. So if you have a strong opinion about this, um, come and tell us why you don't like it. Um, it's not set in stone. We just don't really want to support more than two branches at once. Oh. So like we mentioned, the, the biggest amount of effort that we put into 9000 was to get compatibility finally caught up with CRuby. And we feel like we've, we've mostly done that, modulo a couple gaps. Uh, but it'll mean that we're now, we can mostly release in lockstep. When Ruby 2.3 comes out later this year, Within a couple months, we should be able to do a JRuby release that has the same features. It's going to be much easier for us to keep up. Um, we are leveraging both Ruby spec, which is now an official Ruby core project. I don't know if anybody saw the announcement. Uh, and their test suite, their normal uh, mini unit, test unit test suite. Uh, we run as many tests as we possibly can to make sure that we're compatible. Uh, there are a couple known gaps that we wanted to talk through just so people know that there's a few things that aren't quite done yet as far as 2.2. Uh, so refinements, is anybody using refinements or playing with it? That's good. <laughs> um, so refinements are basically lexically scoped monkey patching. You can monkey patch only within a given file or within a given class. Uh, and it's, it's very tricky to support, both in JRuby and in standard Ruby. Uh, we didn't get it completely finished for the 9000 release, uh, but it should, be, should come in an update soon. And for folks that, that aren't familiar with it, uh, say we have a method, add name, that's just going to take a, a presumably a string and add some additional text to it. Uh, normally this would be string plus, and uh, you, it'd do what you expect it to. But you can also define a refinement that will monkey patch that. So we have our string add scrub uh, refinement here that refines string by redefining the plus method to do something slightly different. Uh, so in this case, we're just going to scrub both of those two strings before we add them together. And actually, it occurs to me now this may actually uh, uh, be recursively a, a bad implementation, but you get the idea. We can monkey patch this uh, so that it will uh, throw a stack overflow. Uh, 
and so then you can throw this using line into uh, a script body or a class body, and then only within that script or class will that monkey patch take effect. Uh, so to understand why it's a little difficult to support this, here's the logic for a normal method call. We've got a target object, we need to make a call. Uh, so we look at the class, look at its method tables and its parents' method tables, and uh, find the method in there. Presumably it's there, we call it, and we continue on. Uh, to do a refined method call is considerably more difficult. We need to first grab all the refinements that are in scope, so anything that has been using into that, that file, look for the target class in the list of refinements, uh, look in that refined class for the method we want, and then, then if we find that, we can use the patched version. If we don't, then we fall back on the original logic. So it's very different from normal method dispatch, and getting the semantics of this right have been challenging both for the core Ruby folks and for us. Uh, so it's not quite done. Uh, and the interesting thing about this, or the, 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 the unpleasant thing about this for me, is that in the future, you're not necessarily going to be able to look at this code and know what that method call is going to do. You're going to need to look around in the same file, look around in the class, and see if those other monkey patches have been using into your scope. So it, it helps localize monkey patches, but it is still basically monkey patching and has a lot of the same issues that go along with that. Keyword args is the other thing that didn't quite uh, get finished, although it's really... Yeah, it's really only one problem, and, I, and we'll show you what it is in particular. You'll notice in Ruby spec we actually have 13 failures. Ten of those is us not responding the proper number of times to two hash, which might be a bug, might be an optimization, but it's not related to 2.2. And one is just we don't handle block binding. I'll, I'll talk about why block binding is so complicated later. Um, so here's a typical um, keyword argument uh, call, and we work. Um, we replace the A2 keyword with one, because we're passing that. Yay, rest arguments is empty. Um, if we switch this, and then we pass in a string key instead of a symbol key, we're broken. Um, we should be doing this. We should be populating the rest argument with that hash, and not changing the keyword argument we actually change the keyword argument and have an empty rest argument. Now, what does this do? <laughs> Just happened to notice this while looking into this problem. Um, it's a really weird looking call. Uh, we don't work with this either, but it's the same basic problem. And MRI does this. It, <laughs> it takes the left and right side, puts it into the rest argument, and then updates the keyword arg. Only, only the symbols actually go into keyword args. If you're mixing symbols and strings, you get interesting behavior like this. And so there's this extra splitting logic that we just need to add. All right, I talked a bit about this last year, about how we've uh, uh, gone below the JVM to make better compatibility for I.O., for process, uh, and the transcoding stuff. Uh, I'll go through it just quickly this year a little bit. Uh, so one of the problems we have building Ruby on top of the Java platform is that Java is intended to have the same behavior across all platforms. And that unfortunately means it hides a lot of the platform specifics and unfortunately a lot of the, the features we want in Ruby compatibility. Uh, on the other hand, Ruby's I.O., Ruby's process, those really embrace the platform. They're mostly thin wrappers around uh, a spawn call or read-write calls at the native level, and they will work like you would expect a C program to work. So if you're expecting the native platform behavior, it's a little difficult to get that on JRuby or on the JVM, uh, and that's what Ruby needs to be able to do. So for this release, we went through the extra effort of using mostly native calls for most of I.O. and pretty much all of process. Uh, this gives us the best possible POSIX behavior, Unix behavior, of any JVM language. No one is going to be as compatible with standard Unix process beha behavior uh, than us. Uh, and it allows us to do things like this, which just are not possible with any other JVM language. So here we, we spin up three pipes uh, in, out, and error for our child process. 
we're going to spawn just the cat program, the cat command, uh, with the client side, uh, the, the, the child side, rather, of those in, out, and error. Then we've got a PID that, we can rep that represents that running process. Uh, we'll close the client side on the parent side, because we don't need that side of the pipe anymore. Uh, write something to the in side of the, uh, the stream. That goes to the child. Close that out. Read from the child's output, and the cat does what it's supposed to do. It prints a line number and the text that we sent into it. Uh, and then the wait PID call at the bottom does everything that you'd supposed to do, that you'd expect it to do. And most of these calls in here actually are doing a real native call down to the equivalent C function that MRI, that C Ruby would use. So you get the right behavior, you can share these file descriptors in ways that other JVM languages can't, and there's a lot of work to make this all work nicely. But, but process management, IO stuff, much more compatible with the way Ruby does it now. Uh, the transcoding, uh, Tom mentioned this was a, a big porting effort that's ha gone over many years. Uh, in JRuby 1.7, we basically emulated the CRuby transcoding encoding logic on top of Java's built-in support. Uh, and that worked okay, but it unfortunately meant that whenever we had to convert from one encoding to another, we had to pass it through a character array because all Java stuff goes to and from 16-bit characters. Uh, in JRuby 9000, we actually finished the porting process of, of taking all of CRuby's transcoding encoding logic and ported it over to the JVM. It works great. All the compatibility is significantly better. And it should match the same behavior on CRuby and JRuby for even the weirdest encodings that they support. Uh, so we're really excited about that. It also plugs into I.O. properly, so as data is read off the line, it gets decoded into the right character format, and there's a lot less overhead than our old JVM version. All right, back to you. So we have a new runtime, um, uninventively called internal representation. Um, the, the seed of this came from Subramania Sastri, who's been working on it and working with us for the last five years. Um, we knew that um, we wanted to make a change. We wanted to work with semantics and not syntax. This is the abstract syntax tree for the code on the left. Um, and JRB 1.7, we basically, when we start interpreting, we just start bouncing around through that tree. When you generate Java bytecode, we start bouncing around through the tree. So what we're doing now um, is we created a set of instructions, like a virtual machine. And now these things represent our semantics. If we look at line eight, you can see we're calling the plus method on the receiver A and giving it C, A plus C. So this is fairly easy to, to read. We also wanted to make things more approachable. Um, so if you've ever taken a compiler's course, nothing here is gonna look unusual or strange. On the left side, we have the typical phases of a, a, a traditional compiler design. If we look at the right, we see a lot of common vocabulary abstract syntax trees, control flow graphs, basic blocks. You get the picture. So we do actually have an example of this. Um, Sean, who's been contributing a lot to Rails, um, found a performance bug in both JRuby and in, in, did I say JRuby? MRI and JRuby, CRuby and JRuby. So this is the method, it's in Rails, it's an active record. Um, <coughs> when you use a block parameter, and you go and pass it on, and you don't use it. And JRuby, before this uh, optimization, and MRI today, it'll actually create a proc instance, even though it doesn't use the proc instance. And this has some overhead. Um, oh, actually, the numbers are right there. So in two or three days, um, we worked through the issues with Sean. He made a compiler pass. Um, and we got a nice bump, um, like six million more things in the micro benchmark, which happens to be like MRI's actual performance. So that was very cool. And the evidence, if you go and look at this file in Active Record, you'll see that there's a version guard or an implementation guard. And we have the nice idiomatic Ruby. And MRI has like this extra block to get rid of this overhead. So that's quite cool. Another realization that we've been making over the last couple of years is 
how much easier it's been to debug um, performance and correctness issues. When we find a problem, we, we just start it up in the interpreter, we step through it in the debugger, we solve it, and miraculously, it fixes it in both the interpreter and the JIT. So um, we're spending a lot less time looking below that opaque barrier of Java bytecode to figure out what went wrong. So now we'll, uh, it's where the wheels hit the pavement of reality here. Um, how we're doing versus JRuby 1.7. The first one's the dreaded topic of JRuby startup time. We knew in JRuby 9000 that we had a challenge because in both cases we make an abstract syntax tree, but 9000 we additionally make a set of instructions. So this is clearly more work and uh, um, it's responsible for us starting slower. We knew this years ago, um, and we're, we were gonna fix it. We we're gonna fix it with IR persistence. So when we go and compile some Ruby code and generate um, IR, we'll just go and save that IR away. And then if we load the same file again, we'll just load that IR and save all that work. Problem solved. Well, <laughs> As it turns out, the amount of data that we save in IR is quite a bit more than the original Ruby source. And so it works out to take about exactly the same amount of time as just parsing it over. Um, IR persistence itself, we still use. Um, we use it for all of our ahead of time compilation. So we dump that, f that blob into a Java class file. So it's still useful and we haven't given up on it, but for startup time, um, this was kind of a dead end. So plan B, Let's make this uh, make IR thing as cheap as possible. And in that case, um, most of that time was spent doing um, compiler passes to optimize the code. So here's where we stand today. Um, we run IR Builder, which just makes one big long list of instructions. We don't run any compiler passes, optimizations on it. And we had to develop a special interpreter to be able to run on that big long list of instructions. Um, so that, per, that mostly solves the startup issue. Um, if, if that method runs for a while, then we run compiler passes and then run a better interpreter or a full interpreter. Um, most of you will be running in mixed mode, and so instead of running the full interpreter, it'll just go off and generate Java bytecode. So the actual numbers, uh, if you're running something that takes longer, you won't really notice any difference at all. Um, for things that are shorter, it's usually about 10 to 15% slower. Um, we're, we're gonna keep chipping away at this, but it is what it is. Memory is something that we're getting a lot more aggressive about. Um, this slide shows you that we're making continual progress on this. Um, this is just running Rails console with a nearly empty app. You can see in JRuby 1.7, um, we're using about 68 megs of memory. Um, when we put out JRuby 9000, we we're using 88 megs, and today on master, we're down to 80. Um, by the time we put out 0.1, we should be down about 75. So we actually will be using less memory in 9000 a few point releases from now, but not, not yet. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, straight line performance as well. Uh, we didn't spend a great deal of time on this during the 9000 cycle. Our primary goal was to get compatibility up where it should be, make sure the runtime was stable, fix as many language bugs as possible. Uh, but we wanted to at least be roughly on par with JRE 1.7 before we did our .0 release. Uh, so it should improve rapidly after this point. Now that we've got the main release out, we can iterate on performance and, and should be able to go much faster. Uh, so here's, it's kind of a mixed bag. Here's a, a few benchmarks where we're slightly slower. There's some benchmarks where we're slightly faster. Um, anything that uses a block dispatch heavily is a little bit faster in 9000. We do a little better job of optimizing it. So overall, most things should be roughly equivalent to what they were in 1.7. Uh, if there's anything that looks bad, let us know. It's usually not a difficult fix. And in general, most folks that are going to be running JRuby, they're going to be scaling this stuff horizontally anyway. So you still can take your one JRuby instance and get, uh, as in the case here, uh, uh, we'll be hearing more about this later today, uh, getting 900,000 records per second. We've heard many folks saying that they're getting much better performance on, on certain sorts of applications. Uh, nobody's reported anything that's severely slower 
Uh, it's usually on par or better in 9000 for the most part. Uh, and of course, we also have lots of folks that just get better scaling from JRuby either way. Uh, one group had uh, several, uh, I think it was 15 extra large AWS instances that went down to like 10 mediums uh, when they switched from MRI to JRuby. So just being able to actually use all of the hardware, you end up scaling out a lot better. Okay, so this is back to you. Um, so some things we're going to be working on in, in, in the near term. The first one is uh, block parameter binding represented in IR. Um, what I mean by block parameter binding is in this first simple example, we're passing one and two into this proc, and A gets one and B gets two. That's the binding. Um, but of course, blocks are, are more complicated and can be much more complicated. The next example, we're um, destructuring a list. We're stuffing a couple of the elements into a splatted uh, um, variable. And uh, we borrowed from uh, Rubinius's code base just because uh, they represent all this block binding logic as a single method. So it, it, it's a good way of showing the general complexity of block binding. So um, by the time you, uh, you can start to see some equations here. These equations are typically like figuring out where a certain class of variables are getting put along that thing. And I, um, I removed some comments and shortened up some lines so that it would fit into four slides. Um, but the takeaway here is that there's a lot of logic. Like I pointed out earlier, we're not even passing 100% of our block uh, um, binding test cases. Um, but what we want to do it, when we compile a block, we compile that block, we want to go and emit some code before that block to do the, the block binding logic in IR as instructions, then let our compiler pass as churn on that and then pass it off to hotspot and those two phases are going to go and get rid of a lot of that complexity and fold away some branches and it basically works because we're manually inlining that logic into each block right now we have a helper method everything calls through that helper method it never inlines um, IR also has an inlining system itself which is not enabled I'll mention that um, but we need to actually be able to emit this logic in IR if we want to inline blocks or, or more complicated blocks. And we're not going to boil the ocean. We're not going to put four pages of logic in the front of every block because that's probably not going to work out. Um, this is how things look today. Um, in particular, all the compiler passes we run they're static and they're conservative. We never have any reason to ever de-optimize this code. But because of that, we can't do more speculative or aggressive optimizations. Um, we have a profiler mode. If we turn this on, it starts to collect information. And then we can start doing more aggressive optimizations. If those optimizations pay off, we get much better performance. If they don't, then we have to back off and do something else. And some of those optimizations are the ability to um, inline methods and blocks. We actually have code for this. The blocks that we support are incredibly simple. Um, but it did bit rot a bit in the last few months as we were trying to get 9,000 out the door. Um, we want to be able to handle unboxing. We have experimental paths for that as well. Um, this just means instead of when we make a Ruby fix num, instead of making a Java object that wraps a field with a Java primitive long in it, we're just going to interact with the Java primitive log by itself and get rid of all that allocation overhead. Um, Invoke Dynamic is a fantastic tool for performance, but we found out that once it gets to a certain size, um, the warm up is just too slow. So once we can start profiling information, we'll just only add Invoke Dynamic to the, the hottest um, parts of our apps and still get that great performance. Uh, because of the changes to the startup interpreter, um, our plans for how we de-optimize has to change, and this is probably our most significant thing we need to work on next. Um, and we want to reduce the cost. We, we have an experimental profiler, but it, I think it takes like 4% of the runtime to, to collect the statistics, and that's just way too expensive. And figuring out what code is actually hot is surprisingly challenging. So. 
So then on the JVM side, of course, we're going to continue to try and use what the JVM provides better, uh, better use of Invoke Dynamic, reducing the overhead, uh, structuring the calls a little differently so that they optimize well at the JVM level. Uh, there are a few different libraries uh, coming around the corner now. Uh, the Nashorn guys, the, the Oracle uh, JavaScript implementation, they did a big project to uh, make it possible for integer code to just use integers and float code to just use floats and turn that into a library that ideally we'd be able to use to get the same performance, the same specialization, so that when you write a numeric algorithm in JRuby, it would optimize down to the same numeric code that if you wrote it in Java. Uh, VM Boiler is another little utility library, kind of experimental at this point, but lots of JVM folks are working on that problem of getting rid of numeric objects and turning them into just raw numeric values. Uh, for Java 9 and beyond, uh, I'm going to be working with some of the Oracle folks on the value types JSR. There will be a value type in the next version of the JVM. This basically means it's not a full-on object. It's just part of the call stack. It would save a lot of overhead, doesn't put any uh, extra uh, hit on the allocating on the GC. It's pretty close in performance to what you would get with unboxed numerics. Uh, and then there's also going to be a, a, a JIT interface, hopefully it will get into Java 9, that allows the new Graal JIT uh, to plug in, which will work with uh, the, the truffle stuff we're going to have someone talk about in just a little bit. Uh, the last thing that we really want to do is continue to improve how we present our continuous integration, how our, how our dist artifacts, our nightly artifacts are available. Uh, one of the big areas is that we would like to be doing better with Windows support. Is anybody here using Windows? That's usually with you. Okay, so there are a couple, there are a couple. We want to have our tests run just as well on Windows as they do on the Unix systems. Uh, it's mostly a matter of getting it set up, spending a couple weeks working through the failing tests, and then, then having continuous uh, testing on that platform. We have a nightly dist, but uh, right now it doesn't have all of the different release artifacts. It's missing the Windows installer, it's missing the complete jar with all the standard library in it. Uh, so we want to get that improved. But you can go to ci.jruby.org, and every night there'll be an updated build of 9,000 and an updated build of the 1.7 line. Uh, and then because we're using so many native calls, we need to do a little bit better job of uh, testing that native support on various platforms. We have it running in Travis on Linux. Uh, we try to run it periodically on OS 10 and a couple other platforms, but there's more areas that people are using JRuby that we need to test against. Uh, and at this point, we're going to bring in our, our special guest to talk about uh, a bit more distant future work uh, at, uh, in JRuby. Uh, and I'll introduce Chris Seaton from Oracle. All right. Thanks so much for lending me some of your keynote time. Uh, so I'm Chris Seaton. I'm a research manager at Oracle Labs and a PhD student at Manchester in the UK. I'm going to talk about the, the new Truffle backend in JRuby. I'm going to focus on going from a research project more towards being something that's a product that could be used. Um, Oracle wants, you to, wants me to warn you that this is just a research project, so you shouldn't buy any Oracle stock or products based on what I'm telling you. This is kind of the, the point of the talk about going from research. So what is Truffle? Truffle is a new backend for JRuby. Um, it's quite technical. I could spend a lot of time explaining how it worked, but in general, the idea is we take an AST interpreter for Ruby, like JRuby used to have in the 1.7 branch, like MRI used to be um, in the 1.8 times. Um, but we take that AST, and then what we do is we gradually type it as it runs. So as your AST runs, we see the types that are involved, such as string or double or integer, and then we type the tree. So as the program runs, we replace nodes in the tree with these specialized versions. This is an algorithm we call AST specialization. and allows us to improve the performance of your program as it's running. But the really clever bit is the next thing we do is we take that tree after it's been specialized, and we compile it to machine code. Unlike the way that JRuby currently works, we have our own JIT compiler written in Java. And because it's written in Java, we can use it as a library. We can take all the nodes involved in your AST and produce a single piece of machine code at the end of it. This means that we're no longer having to negotiate very carefully with the JVM, trying to trick it to doing things by using specific bytecodes, um, trying to see what it's doing. We can simply tell it exactly what we want to do. 
We can generate exactly the code we want, and this produces a really high performance implementation of Ruby. We've been talking about it for a couple of years, and generally these are sort of results we've been showing. Um, synthetic benchmarks. So we've got classic benchmarks here you might have heard of, such as N body, pi digits, delta blue. Um, and these are, these are reasonable benchmarks everyone understands well, but they're not really very realistic Ruby code. So Fankov is a program about flipping pancakes. N body is an astronomical simulation, and delta blue is a constraint solver for logic programs. So we do really well on these programs. The, the implementation, this is all relative to MRI. Um, so the numbers off the side are how much faster it is than MRI. Uh, JRuby is in blue, Rubinius in silver. Topaz, which was the PyPy implementation of Ruby is in green, and we're the implementation in purple. So sometimes we're doing 40 times faster, often around 10 times faster. Um, and that's great, but these aren't the sort of programs you people are interested in running. We've produced tons and tons of research from this. So these are some of the papers we've produced while writing this. So if you want to know more about the, the technology, this is where you can go and look. Um, we've got papers on how we support C extensions, how we support object model, how we do all sorts of stuff. And hopefully it's going to be summarized soon in my PhD thesis when I manage to finish this off, which will give a, an overview of the whole thing. But we want to start talking about running real things instead of talking about research. You guys aren't interested in research papers so much as you want to be able to use it. If it's fast, you want to be able to use it, that's great. And so far, you haven't really been able to do that. We're building a large team to work on this. There's now four people working full time, implied by Oracle, on Jerry with Truffle. It's myself, uh, Kevin Menard, who's an existing contributor, Benoit Deleuze, who's an existing Jerry with contributor, and Peter Halupa, who's based in the Czech Republic. And then these are other people who are occasionally help us on specific parts of it or who are working on our JIT compiler. So Oracle's putting a lot of resources, a lot of research power, um, a lot of time and money into this implementation. Um, I think we're now the, the biggest employer of Ruby implementers everywhere, anywhere in the, in the world. Um, so that we're really putting lots into this and we're moving towards making it work. So we do now support a significant proportion of Ruby. We support 93% of the language specs, um, according to Ruby spec, and 89% of the core library specs. Obviously, there's a lot of work still to be done there in that last 10% or so. But we're getting to the point now, now if you've got a, a normal Ruby program, it will likely run. If you've got lots of libraries, it probably won't run, but your, your general Ruby program is likely to start to be able to run. And what do we actually run? So as I said, we run Ruby spec. Um, we run most of the standard library, including things like JSON, test unit. We've started to run some of the infrastructure of the Ruby ecosystem now, such as WebBrick, Rack, we run RSpec, the Redis driver, we run Tilt, it'll be parts of concurrent Ruby. We even run things like Sinatra and Rhoda, and some interesting libraries like Chunky and PSD. When I say we run it, I'm using quite a broad definition there. I mean the, the core functionality that you want to use those libraries for to do something that runs. So you can boot up um, Sinatra and you can serve a page. Not everything's going to run, but we've got that core functionality. That's a big step towards doing that. And what we're going to use to do is start to do this to set up some demonstrations of applications you could run um, over time. So you may think that the performance gains we had on the, the simple benchmarks would go away when we start running real code. And we've really found that hasn't been the case. This is a, a composite, so across lots of different benchmarks, we've taken from um, chunky PNG and PSD to RB. Now, these are extreme cases. We're not going to get this performance on everything, but these benchmarks exercise what we do well, really, really well. So here we've got um, across 43 different benchmarks. You can run them yourself from these links. So this is, again, relative to MRI. And all the other implementations of Ruby don't do much better than MRI here. That's because these benchmarks heavily do allocations. They do small little data structures used temporarily. They do metaprogramming, stuff like that. The other implementations, um, no matter how much effort is put into them, they haven't yet been able to see and optimize through this stuff. And we are. So across all these benchmarks, we're running 40, almost 40 times faster than anything else. And this is real code from Chunky PNG and PSD. It's not artificial benchmarks. And I think this is where the promise of our performance is going to be. Um, Applications like Rails do lots of metaprogramming. They do lots of small data structures, and that's where we do well, and that's where we get these performance numbers from. But Truffle's much, much more than simply being able to run JRuby a bit faster than you did before. Um, we have always enabled features, such as set trace func, although I know Thomas is working on that for normal JRuby now, and object space, each object, they're both always enabled. 
We've got revolutionary performance of things like metaprogramming. I'll show you an example of that in a second. Um, high performance C extensions. We're creating a new implementation of C extensions to bring that back to JRuby. We do it by interpreting the C code, and it's actually faster than running the native code in the experiments we've done. We're looking at interoperability of JavaScript, R, and C in other languages. So we've got a team doing JavaScript, and we're looking at being able to call Ruby from JavaScript and JavaScript from Ruby the same with C, the same with R, and it's really, really fast. We can inline between the two languages. We're looking at revolutionary debug capabilities. So the debugger in JRuby Truffle is always enabled. Um, you can stop the program at any time and, and debug it in introspective. You don't need a special flag to do that. And we're working on a statically linked binary build of JRuby Truffle, so there's no JVM dependency. This will solve the startup problem. We had a build um, a couple of years ago. It's sort of bit rotted since then. But we can start in about 14 milliseconds to run Hello World, similar to what MRI can do. So you don't need the JVM. You simply get this one big binary that is JRuby Truffle. That is a research project still. That's not coming anytime soon. Uh, so this is an example of some of the optimizations we can do that are particularly impressive. Um, I've created this tool called Can We Fold Yet? And you can run this yourself if you go to this Google link. Um, and it tells you what we can constant fold. Constant folding is one of those operations that removes a lot of the work in your program. Um, so uh, this demonstrates the power of our constant folding. So the example, first value is simply 14. And yes, of course, we can constant fold that because it's a constant. We can also constant fold 14 plus 2. And we can do that by speculating that the method won't be redefining, constant folding the arithmetic. We can also do it for eval. So you can eval 14 plus 2 giving a string. And we can constant fold through the eval statement noticing that the string is constant, and we can remove that. Um, we can also constant fold through metaprogramming. So if you do 14 and then send the add operator, yes, we can constant fold through that as well. We can even do it if it's a string. And get this, we can even do it if the method name is calculated by doing L minus exclamation, turn that back into a character from the ord, um, and then call it. Yes, we can constant fold that as well. We can see that expression is constant and go through it. Um, you may have heard about proc binding being the worst feature in Ruby, and it's impossible to optimize. Nope, we can optimize through that as well. So if you see x is 14, create a new proc, and we don't even reference x inside that proc, but then we get the binding of it, get the local variable, so that again, there's a meta program we look up to x, and yes, we can constant fold that to 14. Um, of course, we can't constant fold in everything, so if you try it yourself, you'll find some things work, some things don't. But this is the sort of optimization level we're doing. This is world-leading research in dynamic languages. Other dynamic language implementations, including things like V8, don't do this this well. So now Ruby is getting the best research there is on these sort of implementation issues. Frequently asked questions, when will Truffle run Rails? Probably in the next year to two years. We're working on it very hard. We've got about half of active support running so far, and we're getting there. Isn't startup and warm-up performance worse than it before? It is at the moment. Again, we work on that. It's not something we've put time and effort into, because our our, our benchmarks and our targets we're looking at are peak performance, but we'll work on that. And with things like the, the static build, that will go away. Will Graal be available in a proper open JDK release? As Charlie mentioned, there's a, there's a JEP uh, 243, I think, which looks to put the interface that Graal needs into JDK. So hopefully, in JDK, at some point, Graal will be available. Are we using code from Rubinius? Yes, we use the core library implementation from Rubinius. That's not any kind of political statement. We simply find it easier to optimize Ruby code than we do Java code, so we're using the Rubinius code from that. Should you try Truffle? Your application isn't going to run using Truffle, as simple as that at the moment. But if you run a library, or you've got a very simple application, you'd like to work with us to look at if it will work, then we'd be interested in that, um, particularly if, you are, if your library doesn't have many dependencies, um, or if it's too slow normally. Or, um, is Truffle going to replace normal JRuby? We're not out to form a coup and take over JRuby. Um, Oracle is working with the JRuby people. It's entirely with the JRuby project's leadership's consent. Um, we do have a lot of people working on it, and we do put a lot of commits in, but we're doing greenfield development, whereas the rest of the team isn't. Um, my personal technical opinion is that within a couple of years, Truffle will be good enough to replace the current backend in JRuby. But I'm not advocating that at the moment. And if that happened, it would be because of the community and the leadership decide that's what to happen. So we're not looking to force it upon anyone. And as I said, it is just a research state problem. So please don't buy any Oracle stop or products based on what we're doing. Thanks very much.
All right, again, thanks everybody for coming out. Um, we're really excited that you're here. Um, we're gonna just jump right into the next talk and try to, to, get the, to get things moving along. So I'll hand it off to our MCs here.